September is here, so let's hit the books here on the Paperback Warrior Podcast. Welcome to episode 60 of the Paperback Warrior Podcast. My name is Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're a vintage fiction review and discussion show focused on mid-20th century paperback fiction and the genres of hardboiled crime, espionage, adventure, and westerns. We've got a blog at paperbackwarrior.com where we publish reviews and feature articles about these old books every day. You can also follow Paperback Warrior on Facebook and Twitter to join the community and the discussion. Let me bring on Tom, who's going to tell us what's going on today. All right, Eric. Today we are going to explore the history and legacy of what is arguably the most popular vintage paperback reprint publisher the world has ever seen. I'm talking about the publishing behemoth known as Hard Case Crime. Now, Eric, you're going to review a release that really put that publisher on the map, a book called The Colorado Kid by a young upstart writer named Stephen King. (laughs) In keeping with the theme of horror authors publishing crime novels for hard case crime, I'm going to be reviewing Baby Mall, and that's M O L L, uh, by John Ferris. Now, you went, you got some books from Baltimore, right? Well, kind of, sort of. I didn't travel up to Baltimore or anything like that. I like the city, but I haven't been traveling much since the uh, pandemic arrived. But our paperback warrior email received a nice, uh, a nice little um, message from a company called Boards and Wraps. They're a Baltimore online bookseller that can be found on 8Books, Amazon, Biblio, and and so forth. They had enjoyed hearing our show, and they kindly reached out to us about purchasing some books. I asked for some photos, and I ended up buying just a handful of novels that were extremely affordable. Uh, Here's a few highlights of what I got. Uh, The first one is a novel called Blood Oath by David Morrell. It was originally published in 1982, and Stephen King claims that I'll read it in one sitting. So we'll see about that. I don't think he was talking just to me, but it's literally that blurb on the back of the book. Morrell, of course, is the inventor of Rambo. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, next, a Fawcett Gold Medal novel uh, called A Great Day for Dying. It was authored by a relatively unknown guy to me, uh, an author named Jack Dillon. It was published in 1968. A friend of the show and respected author James Reasoner reviewed it on his blog, and he had a lot of good things to say about it. I'm going to have my review on the blog uh, very soon, and we're also going to talk about it on the show. I got a Whit Masterson novel called Death of Me Yet. Now, typically, Whit Masterson was the pseudonym used by the writing tandem of Robert Wade and Bill Miller. However, in looking at this, the paperback was published in 1970. So it, was, it must have been solely authored by Robert Wade. Yeah, he kept yeah. doing the pseudonym after his yeah. writing partner died. Yeah, Bill Miller died nine years before the book's publication, so yeah. it makes sense. Uh, it's an espionage novel about a KGB sleeper cell, and it was adapted into a film in 1971. And the last book I'm going to talk about is a World War II adventure novel called The Heavy Water Raid. It was published in 1962, and it's written by an author that I know nothing about, a guy named John Drummond. Do you know anything about him? Um, I thought I had John. John didn't he write the the stench of eels and all those that book? No, this that's uh, that was Ian. I think it was. No, uh, no that was Eva, Igor Drummond. No, sorry, suppose. never mind. Yep, it could be a pseudonym, I guess, that he's using. But the synopsis has eleven men in the Norwegian mountains trying to destroy a hidden German base, where the Nazis are attempting to build an atomic bomb. So it's one of those team combat. Uh, kind of a men's adventure novels. And oh, and I also got a reprint of Nightfall uh, by David Goodis, which I've already reviewed on the blog. You can check the archive section for David Goodis and you can find my thoughts on that book there. Uh, but that's what I picked up. That's cool. Hey, Tom, you said uh, you were going to go on the, sh- on, the uh, on the road soon. Is that right? Yes. So this episode's posting on Monday, September 7. Uh, and uh, Friday of this week, on September 11, 2020, I'm going to be in Dallas, Texas on business. Now, I actually don't need to do anything that day until nighttime, and then I'm working uh, Saturday and through the weekend. But uh, So I carved out the entire day of September 11 on Friday to drive around Dallas and just go from used bookstore to used bookstore. Now, you went book shopping in Dallas last year, so where should I go on Friday? You're gonna, I need your advice. Yeah, yeah. So I had some success there last year around the exact same time period. Uh, the first place to check is going to be the Half Price Books headquarters there. It's larger than most of their chain stores, 
And I want to say, gosh, I got about 30 books there probably last year. Oh, that's good. Uh, the other place would be Lucky Dog Books. Uh, they had a really uh, robust collection of mystery, western, and they had uh, a lot of action and military magazines in the back, so you'll want to check that out. Uh, I had a lot of success digging in there. Uh, two stores that I never got to, to visit was Recycled Books, which is on the square in Denton, so you're going to have to drive just a little bit to the northwest. The other one is Paperback Plus, which is in Mesquite, and it's going to be on the other side, to the east of central Dallas, so you'll have to do some driving. I met a fan of the show uh, there at the um, Lucky Dog Books. Remind me to give you his name and number. He's really helpful, and he can prov- provide you more stores to check out. I think there's a few more. All right, cool. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy Does Dallas coming up on Friday, so yeah. looking forward to that. I'll, hopefully I'll come back and uh, have some good stories to tell about books that I found. Uh, speaking of good stories, do you got a minute for an old book story? Let's do it. Okay. So I think this is fun and interesting story, but uh, if you don't, you're welcome to edit this out of the show with no hard feelings from me, okay? All right. All right, so in the 1980s, as a teenager, I lived in a suburb of Washington, D.C. called Alexandria, Virginia, and I had a part-time job at a used bookstore, uh, which also sold comic books, called Tomorrow Books that later changed its name to Aftertime Comics. It's on King Street. So there's a trade association for booksellers and bookstores and publishers in the United States called the American Booksellers Association. And every year they would have their massive convention in Washington, D.C. Back then it was called the ABA, American Booksellers Association Convention, but later it got rebranded to Book Expo years later. At this convention, authors and publishers spent a fortune setting up a convention floor for the purpose of romancing booksellers to get their current and upcoming releases in on the shelves in bookstores for the next year. Make sense? Right. Okay. So even though my friends and I just worked at this rinky-dink little independent uh, used bookstore, we were ABA members, and we went to the convention. Now, as a teenage boy who was into books, the convention really offered me two things. I got to meet tons of celebrities who were re- releasing books. I remember meeting Vanna White, oh, P- really? Peter Straub, Andrew Vox, Clive Barker, Penn and Teller, Mr. Wow. Rogers, Jeez. Spike Lee, and on and on and on. Come on. So th- it was kind of cool because, you know, it just, it just was whichever celebrity happened to yeah. have a book coming out the next year. I'm sure most, knowing what I know now, wait, most of those books were, wait, were wait. ghostwritten. Yeah. Was Vanna White, was she promoting her Playboy? No, no, she, she'd she written a book. I can't remember oh, what okay. it was called. But, uh, but yeah, she was very nice. And, okay. uh, and I got a picture with her and talked to her for a while. The second thing there for me, and this is, will appeal to you a little more than being in, in, you know, a stargazer, was you get tons and tons. And I mean, Eric, a station wagon full from my wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling of free books. Wow. Now, some of the books are autographed by the authors. Some were retail releases. Some were advanced readers' copies. The publishers would literally just stack these books up into like 10 feet high stacks and beg you to take them. You could take all you want for free because their whole thing is that they wanted to hype the books to booksellers. So the booksellers would, uh, you know, order these books for their, you know, B. Dalton or wherever you happen to work. So pause the story for a minute. I need to fill in some blanks here about something that was also happening around that window of time. Okay. In 1984, an unknown author sold his first novel. It was a military thriller for $5,000 to a small academic publisher called the Naval Institute Press, located in Annapolis, Maryland. This hardcover book was published on October 1, 1984. Eric, it was called The Hunt for Red October oh, yeah. by Tom Clancy. Over the next six months, it sold 45,000 hardcover copies, and then Pro- President Ronald Reagan read the book and endorsed it, and it became a hardcover bestseller, selling 365,000 more copies. The paperback rights were uh, acquired by Berkeley Books for about $50,000, and the novel then sold another 4.3 million copies. Mm. Massive hit. You kind of know the rest of the story about this phenomenon about the book. Uh, The movie with Sean Connery and Alec Baldwin came out, and the launching of the Jack Ryan series of books and movies. Uh, it became, you know, it be- Tom Clancy became one of the biggest authors on planet Earth, and uh, but it all began with the Hunt for Red October. Now, Tom Clancy followed up the Hunt for Red October with a standalone novel 
called Red Storm Rising that was released in August 1986. It was a hit, but his fans really wanted to read more about his main character, Jack Ryan, the hero from Hunt for, uh, Hunt for Red October. Right. And again, I'm just setting the stage for what happened to me. But an important thing to know is that as big a hit as Tom Clancy was worldwide after those first two books, it was dwarfed in comparison to his popularity in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. So you got 26,000 people working at the Pentagon there. you got 21,000 people working for the CIA, another 20,000 people with the FBI, plus all the military veterans and defense contractors all crowded into this one city. Yeah, Tom Clancy was like the Beatles in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and my dad, Tom Sr., uh, who worked for Ronald Reagan at the time, was a huge Tom Clancy fan, and he wasn't a guy who was always at the tip of the spear regarding pop culture. So you following this so far? Tom Clancy was huge in D.C. Your father worked for Ronald Reagan, and you piled around with Babe Vanna White. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, these are three separate uh, <laughs> totally s- silos of those things. But... I'm with you so far. Okay. The story I want to tell you begins in May 1987. I was 17 years old, and I just finished the 12th grade. My buddies and I get tickets to the ABA convention. It was me, Chris, Dave, Ford, Bill, Tommy G. We were all psyched to get a, some, a lot of free books. And we all had backpacks to put our freebies in. We were planning our attack around author signings based on who we wanted to meet and get our pictures taken with. Um, I remember because it was a Saturday. I also remember that a couple of us were walking by the booth for a publisher called G.P. Putnam's Sons. And there was kind of a crowd milling about that that booth at the convention floor. And so I pushed my way to the front, and I see that there is a 10-foot-high circular tower of blue trade paperbacks. What they were, Eric, is that they were advanced reader's copies of the book Patriot Games Ah, by Tom Clancy. And I also knew that this was eight weeks before the hardcover of this book was going to be released. It was a thick book, 540 pages long, and it was a prequel to Hunt for Red October starring Jack Ryan. Exactly what Tom Clancy fans like my dad and everyone else in Washington, D.C. was dying to get their hands on. So when the rope line dropped, I walked over to the stack, and, and Eric, there were hundreds of copies there for free. And I helped myself to 11 copies of the book right into my paperback and under my arms and, and just as many as I can carry away. Again, I'm 17 years old. My moral compass was maybe not fully developed then. But now I had these 11 copies of the most anticipated novel in, if not America, certainly Washington, D.C., and I knew that I had struck gold. So that night, I bring back the hundreds of advanced readers copies I'd gotten that day, including the 11 copies of Patriot Games. Keep in mind that this is 1987. There's no eBay, and uh, D.C. was a pretty cosmopolitan town, so there's no, like, swap meet. But I have these 11 books, and I wanted to monetize them somehow. I wanted to make some money here. But yeah. I didn't really have a good way to do it. There's nowhere to sell these books. Um, I also knew that in eight weeks, these advanced reader's copies will have a value to, uh, only to collectors because the hardcover is going to be everywhere in D.C. You following this so far? You've got 11 copies of a book that's in high anticipation. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge demand, right? But I don't really have a great way to unload them. Again, this is pre-eBay. And, um, and so I give one copy to my dad, who is thrilled. So now I have 10 books to unload, right? Now, Eric, you're from a small town in southern Virginia, right? Have you ever been to Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia? I haven't been there. My trips up there were basically just to see bands playing in Springfield or downtown. Okay. Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia is one of those colonial American towns that they've done a nice job of preserving to keep it very quaint and touristy. The main drag is called King Street, and it stretches for 15 blocks with the Potomac River to the east and the George Washington Masonic Temple to the west. Shooting off King Street are expensive old row houses and cobblestone streets. Alexandria City Hall is down toward the east side of the street, and then there's a big, beautiful fountain in the town square. I'm just trying to draw a mental picture for you. And so if you picture uh, the old town of St. Augustine uh, near where we live or Georgetown in Washington, D.C., you get the kind of, the idea of a town that's gone to great lengths to preserve its quaint old world charm. Yeah. And in, in May 1987, across from that fountain at City Hall was a very busy branch of one of America's three largest bookstore chains at the time, a store called Crown Books. Do you remember Crown Books? I don't. Okay. No. They must not have had them down where you lived. But now, on a Saturday in May 
in Old Town Alexandria, in the heart of King Street, it is a total circus. The streets are packed with tourists and locals just kind of getting out and about. And it's one of those towns where you just you go, you take a girl on a date just to walk up and down King Street because yeah. it's so nice. Yeah, it makes sense. And if you were there on that Saturday afternoon around 1 p.m., 33 years ago, you would have seen a 17 year old me with a large backpack walking down King Street and stopping about 10 feet to, from the front door of Crown Books. I reached into my backpack, oh, <laughs> I pulled out a copy of the Advanced <laughs> Reader's Copy of Patriot Games, oh, and I started boy. talking at the top of my lungs. I said, ladies and gentlemen, look what I have here, the long-awaited sequel to Tom Clancy's <laughs> monster hit, The Hunt for Red October, starring his action hero, Jack Ryan. This book is not available in stores. Go on in and ask Crown Books to sell you one, and they won't because they don't have it. This book is not available to the public for another two months, but today and today only, I will sell you this copy in my hand for $20 cash right here, right now. You can be the envy of all your friends. As you know, Father's Day is coming up, and you can make your dad the envy of all his pals. And on and on and on. (laughs) And you know what happened? People stopped. They wanted to take a look at the book to make sure it was real. They wanted to see the copyright page. And then what they mostly did is they went inside Crown Books to see if they had the book in stock which, of course, they didn't. And then people came out, and they bought the book from, from me for 20 bucks again and again wow. <laughs> and again. And so I stood outside for probably about an hour selling the books until I had one left. And at that point, the manager of Crown Books comes outside, and he is yeah, super he's pissed. Yeah. He's super pissed. So he grabs the last remaining book from my hands and turns it over to the back, which, and he goes, see what it says here? Advanced reading copy, not for sale. What you are doing is highly illegal. <laughs> now, even though he was a grown-up and I was a kid, I was a 17-year-old high school wrestler and weightlifter and with way too much testosterone. I wasn't going to get bullied by the manager of Crown Books. <laughs> so I snatched the trade paperback back from him. I said, what are you going to do? What are you, the effing book police? And I go, uh, you got a problem, you call 911. See how far that gets you. Otherwise, I'm on public property. Beat it. And so he storms back inside the bookstore in a huff. And I quickly sold the last copy and I hightailed it out of there with 200 bucks. 200 bucks. Cash. <laughs> Again, burning a hole in my pocket. That was big money to me in, in when I was 17. Wow. I mean, that's, you know, it's got to be an easier way. That's the easiest way to make $200 than mowing grass all summer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, and so there's one epilogue to the story. So my family lived about 10 miles south of that bookstore in a, in a kind of middle-class neighborhood called Hybla Valley. Our neighborhood had a community swimming pool. Now, if, if you're picturing it as a country club, you're way overshooting. It was just the neighborhood swimming pool. So two weeks after I unloaded those books and had 200 bucks in my pocket, my dad is sitting at a chair at the neighborhood pool reading his advanced copy of Patriot Games. Mm. And a dude from the neighborhood walks by my dad's chair and says, wow, that's a good book. And my dad, who admittedly can be a bit arrogant at times, says, oh, you must be mistaken. This book isn't out for a couple months. You see, this is an advanced copy. And the guy goes, oh, I know. I bought one a couple weeks ago from this guy on the street in Old Town, Alexandria, selling them out of a backpack. What's the chances? Yeah, so that's my Patriot game story. Wow. Do you remember what you uh, what you did with the two hundred dollars? Like what, what you what you spent on? Uh, probably probably, probably used books. Yeah, probably bought more <laughs> books. <laughs> yeah. So today I went on eBay because uh, there was and and I saw that there are tons of advanced readers' copies of Patriot games available on eBay. <laughs> Some of them were priced as high as a hundred bucks, but I went in to look and see what they were actually getting if they were sold. Like twenty bucks. Yeah, twenty bucks. Yeah. So, because uh, again, Jeez. once the book comes out, the advanced reader's copy becomes worthless to anyone other yeah. than collectors. Did you uh, Did you run this uh, Run this on, on on any other other books that you got? No, I, uh, I had some other scams to kind of turn those books into cash, uh, yeah. which I probably shouldn't talk about. Uh, I don't know what the statute of limitations <laughs> right. is on those, but um, yeah. but the that was the one that I knew. Again, every now and then a book comes out like. Um, that just like the Da Vinci Code or the Firm, or that just where every third person on any bus or airplane you get on is reading that book, and that's what yeah. Patriot Games really was at the time. So it was just at the right place at the right time. Right. Right. Anyway, so enough memory lane. You want to do the feature now? Yeah, go for it. I right, play the music. Our feature today is on hard case crime. Our story begins with a guy named Charles Arday. Arday. I think it's Arday. Okay, Charles Arday, who was born in 1969, so he's one year older than me. Now, I may have my timeline a little mixed up here, but I know Arday was an aspiring mystery writer, and I recall seeing his name in Digest, maybe Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine or Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine, maybe in the mid-90s. And so it was clearly a side hustle because his real career was in computers. 
Now, Eric, you were actually pretty early as an internet user in the 1990s. Do you remember a dial-up internet service called Juno mm. that competed head-to-head with like AOL, Prodigy, oh, yeah. and CompuServe? Yeah, and I think they were touted as being the least expensive carrier, but they were really popular. Okay, so Charles Arday was the founder and CEO of Juno. He founded the company in 1996, and at some point, the company merged with Net Zero, and there was a stock offering. And I don't know the details, but my impression is that Mr. Arday did quite well from this venture. So smash cut forward in time to 2004. Arday has a friend named Max Phillips, and they have a brainstorm together. They were both avid readers of the old hard-boiled crime pulp paperbacks that we love and talk about here, and they decided to form a publishing company called Hard Case Crime to reprint complete and unabridged copies of the books that they loved from the 1950s and thereafter. Now, this had been done before. An imprint called Black Lizard did a popular series of classic reprints in the 1980s, then maybe even into the 1990s, I think, um, putting out classic crime novels by Jim Thompson, Harry Whittington, and David Goodis. And they had these colorful, artsy covers that people liked. I thought those covers looked like dog crap. You know the ones I'm talking about? Yeah, I can't stand those. I hate them too, okay. and uh, But other people seem to like them. Every time I see one, post one online, they're like, oh, I love those covers. Yeah. Um, so Hard Case Crime's big innovation wasn't just reprinting old novels. It was reprinting them as mass market paperbacks with new alluring cover art drawn in the old style. They hired classic cover artists like Robert McGinnis uh, to do some of their covers and modern artists who would also draw in that old style. You see, by 2004, the book market was not really expanding that much. It was contracting. The internet had caught fire. Mega bookstores like Borders and Barnes & Noble were putting independent bookstores out of business, but it would just be a few short years before even they collapsed under their own weight from the massive pressure of Amazon. Hard Case Crime's first release was in September 2004, and it was a reprint of a Lawrence Block novel that I loved called Mona. Now, Hard Case Crime released it under its original manuscript name of Grifter's Game, and it probably wouldn't have made much of a splash if they hadn't hired an artist by the name of Chuck Pyle to do the new cover. Now, you recently read and reviewed Grifter's Game for the Paperback Warrior blog. G- give us a real quick capsule review of it. Yeah, I mean, we all know who Lawrence Block is, so I'm not going to waste your time introducing him. But as Tom said, the book was originally a faucet gold medal paperback, uh, originally called Mona from 1961. The paperback introduces us to a con man named Joe Martin. And as we meet Martin, he steals this suitcase and an identity from a man called Leonard K. Blake. And he quickly discovers that Blake uh, had this lucrative amount of heroin you know, kind of tucked into the suitcase. So Martin begins planning his next con when he meets this uh, young, uh, beautiful woman named Mona. And in Lawrence Block's writing, you know, even at this early stage, uh, it was so tight and effective. And the book doesn't possess, you know, an ounce of filler or padding. Instead, the compelling plot speeds along as Mona and Martin's heated passion intensifies. So the convincing narrative offers an unusual balance beam for readers to walk. They can either cheer Martin's criminal behavior or hope that all the characters face a downfall. With no distinct heroes, I was still invested in the characters' slow, spiraling descent through robbery, murder, and adultery. Block's ending gave me chills, and that's a monumental feat considering it was originally published 60 years ago. Uh, Mona, or if you want to call it Grifter's Game, is a masterful crime noir that proved Lawrence Block was something truly special even 60 years ago. The affordable Grifter's Game version by Hard Case Crime is a must-have, and a great starting point to embrace the author's bold and impressive crime fiction. Thanks, Eric. And I second your assessment. It's one of my favorites. And the the partnership between Lawrence Block and Hard Case Crime as his prestige reprint house continued for years to follow. They reprinted a Lawrence Block book called The Sex Shuffle from 1964 under the name Lucky at Cards. If you liked uh, card cheat uh, femme fatale stories, you're going to love that one. It was the first time the novel had seen a printing in 40 years, and you can check out my review for that one at paperbackwarrior.com. Another one I read uh, by Lawrence Block that was reprinted by Hard Case Crime was The Girl with the Long Green Heart. It's another con man novel from 1965 um, involving a Canadian land scheme and, uh, of course, another femme fatale. And, And I love that book, and you can also see the review there. Now, a real coup for Hard Case Crime was a lost Lawrence Block book from 1968 called Sinner Man. Black himself had lost track of the novel over the years until an eagle-eyed fan found a copy under the title Savage Love by Sheldon Lord. The original print run was so minuscule, it was an awesome opportunity to showcase uh, an unknown classic Lawrence Black book. 
Sinner Man's about a guy who inadvertently kills his wife during a domestic squabble fueled by alcohol and high emotions. Instead of calling the police and rolling the dice on a likely manslaughter charge, he decides to run away and create a new identity for himself as an enigmatic wise guy from Miami. It's a really, really good book, and we really have hard case crime to thank for resurrecting these novels, again, with incredibly beautiful cover art. There's many other Lawrence Block books uh, reprinted by Hard Case Crime, but I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. He, he's just I'm thankful for Hard Case Crime for getting this stuff out. The second book that Hard Case Crime published was an original crime novel by the, by the company's co-founder, Max Phillips, called Fade to Blonde, again with a beautiful retro-style cover painted by a guy named Gregory Manchez. And the third book was an Earl Stanley Gardner reprint, And the fourth book was a new book called Little Girl Lost by someone named Richard Alias, A-L-E-A-S, an author no one knew because it was actually a pseudonym for Charles Arday. Of course, the novel has a great illustrated cover that helps spur on sales. I mean, if if you're self-publishing your own book and you have the dough, you could do a lot worse than hiring Robert McGinnis to do your cover, right? Yeah. So Little Girl Lost from 2004 was nominated for both the Edgar Award by the Mystery Writers of America and the Seamus Award by the Private Eye Writers of America. In his second book, uh, Songs of Innocence, was called an instant classic by the Washington Post and was selected as one of the best books of the year by Publishers Weekly. It also won the Seamus Award. Now, both books are written under that name, Richard Alias, and they were optioned for movies by Universal Pictures. So Hard Case Crime was doing very well at this point in the story by selling uh, personal favorite old books that Mr. Arday loved as a ch- you know, when he was young and new authors that he had discovered. Uh, some were good, others were not. But they were all buoyed by the strength of these fantastic covers that he commissioned. So let's spend a second talking about the importance of cover art, Eric. Now, you and I are a couple of hypocrites because we love the classic cover art, but we really care nothing about the artists other than just sort of a, a credit sometimes. There's nothing more tedious than hearing some, some bore go on and on and on about the cover art for an old paperback because I really care about what's between the pages. Yet we both admit, I think, and you can weigh in on this, that good cover art is so important and something that's really lost today by the crummy covers that many publishers are using. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it does. And um, over the, I don't know, maybe the last couple of years, I've actually started to appreciate the cover art more and more. And, and I've actually been looking at the artists and things like that. I can probably thank Bob Dice for that because he's always pointing them out. And uh, I think it's really cool. But I was you know, I was at Barnes & Noble on Saturday with my daughters. And I was scanning the new releases. And it's all just big font titles with the author stamped on the front. There's nothing else. There's nothing visual with the artwork and heck, I don't. I don't think there were even original titles at this point. Tom, I think I saw fifteen new releases with the word "girl" written in the title. Well, hey, I mean, how many? How many trains can this girl drive? <laughs> right. <It's, laughs> I know. Yeah. And so the thing with cover art is that even if an old book has fallen into public domain or you acquire the rights, you don't necessarily have the rights to that old cover art. Then again, the artist's estate may or may not even have the rights to that cover art either, because if the art was a work for hire gig the defunct publisher may own the rights. There's also an argument to be made that while the artist owns the art itself, meaning the canvas with the paint on it, as soon as it becomes packaging for another product by slapping a title and author on the painting, it ceases to be their art and just becomes inconsequential packaging for a 50-year-old product. Now, I have sat through many, many online debates filled with people who are absolutely certain that you can't reprint old covers. And I've heard equally compelling arguments that old cover art from defunct publishers are fair game. What both sides don't understand is that there are no rules. When it comes to civil suits and enforcement of stuff like that, anyone with 50 bucks can sue you if you're a publisher. And so there's no way that the artist's heirs are going to have a copy of the sales and licensing contract that Grandpa signed 50 years ago. So a reprint publisher is probably going to win the lawsuit, but litigation costs money. That's why Mystery Press, for example, puts crappy covers on their reprints. And Armchair Fiction throws caution to the wind and just reprints the old covers based on the assumption that no one really cares. Which is true, because remember, there is no book police, Eric. Now, circling back to hard case crime, they split the baby. Our day is smart enough to not throw money away litigating some dumb dispute over cover art, but he also has the resources to commission awesome cover art from the best canvas painters alive today, and it worked. He sold a lot of books by reprinting some great old stuff, 
and publishing some kind of cool new upstart crime fiction authors. And then something happened in 2005 that was a total game changer for hard case crime. Author Stephen King had always expressed his love and admiration for old crime noir novels that we talk about here of the 1950s and 1960s. Our day thought it would be cool to court Stephen King to provide a blurb he could use on the cover for a hard case crime release. Just a blurb. And we know that Stephen King is a bit of a blurb whore. He blurbs everything. Our, do- our day packages some hard case crime paperbacks and delivers them to Stephen King's accountant in Manhattan, hoping that the accountant will get the package to King. So months go by with no response, and then our day gets a call from Stephen King's agent. The agent says that King does not want to provide a blurb. Instead, King wanted to write a book for hard case crime instead. And that book was The Colorado Kid. It became the 13th release for the publisher, and it sold a bazillion copies. The company was now solvent and able to commission more cover art and acquire the rights to more old and new books to publish. Now, you just read The Colorado Kid, and you're going to review it at the end of the show. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. So I won't spoil that now. Eight years later, Stephen King's agent reaches out again and says that King had just written a short novel called Joyland that he wanted to offer to Hard Case Crime to print. Would they be interested? And of course, our day says yes. They had another massive hit on their hands. I read the book and I thought it was great. It was a carnival noir story. And that's always one of my favorite settings for an old book. And it looks like that lightning is going to strike a third time, Eric. Tell the listener about the recent announcement that Hard Case Crime made, because you've kind of been covering this. Yeah, they just announced that they're going to be publishing a third Stephen King original novel. It's going to come out in March of next year. Uh, The book's called Later, and man, it's got a really beautiful cover. It sounds more like a traditional Stephen King plot than, you know, say your Fawcett Gold Medal crime novel. It's about a boy named Jamie who has some kind of psychic power that his mom wants suppressed for his own safety. Then in NYPD, a homicide detective enlists Jamie's help in pursuing a killer who threatens to strike from beyond the grave. I'm definitely going to read it. Are you? That's easy, so. Okay. So I'm not going to hold my breath for an advanced reader's copy from them. They've never shown Paperback Warrior an ounce of love. Other reprint houses do outreach to us in hopes that we'll review their books, but every time I've reached out for hard case crime to create any kind of professional relationship, it's been either radio silence or just outright dismissal. They recently released a book of uh, Ray Bradbury, uh, the science fiction author, short crime stories. Like, hey, can I get an advanced reader's copy of that? Yeah. Maybe even a Moby? No. They're like, <laughs> they're like oh, we're, you know, we're only doing some. You know, It was clear that Paperback Warrior was not good enough for hard case crime, right. and that's fine. They're, they're big time, we're small time, but... I, I, you know, I just, I, I wasn't thrilled with their response. Right. So I owe them nothing at all. So I want to share my assessment of this company. I think when they first started, they were right on the money with identifying some of the best pulp paperback originals of their era. And they are to be commended for reprinting books by Charles Williams, Gil Brewer, Peter Rabe, Donald Hamilton, etc. Meanwhile, I've been mostly underwhelmed by their selection of new fiction that they've printed. And I will, I'll carve out the exception of Max Allen Collins' Quarry books and the Nolan books. But I think their new fiction output has been pretty poor. Also, after 66 books, they stopped printing mass market paperbacks that you can fit in your pocket, and they shifted to the larger trade paperbacks. And I guess, and I get that there are business reasons for that, but I still think it sucks. They've given up on trying to emulate the old books that they made a name for themselves by doing. Lastly, I think a lot of their releases are just head-scratching over the past few years. There was no one out there clamoring for a reissue of Joyce Carol Oates' book, Triumph of the Spider Monkey, for the past 40 years. The novel probably sucked then, and I'm sure it sucks now. The fact that over the past 40 years she's become a literary darling doesn't make this book from 40 years ago worth reading. I also think it's interesting that uh, Gore Vidal wrote a Fawcett Gold Medal original t- called Thieves Fall Out under the name Kay Cameron in 1953, but I question the opportunity cost of reprinting it today when there's way better novels from that era that I have never seen the light of day. I was also pretty underwhelmed when they made a huge deal about rolling out their 2020 release, an, an original novel by filmmaker Brian De Palma called Are Snakes Necessary? First of all, it's not like Brian De Palma has exactly been hitting the ball out of the park for the past 20 years as a film director. And also, here's the thing. The novel is co-written by a very talented ghostwriter named Susan Lehman. And spoiler alert, I'll, I'll let you guess which one of them probably actually wrote the novel, right? right? Yep. 
Finally, I get that Earl Stanley Gardner, the author of Perry Mason and the Cool and Lamb series, is crime fiction royalty. But it's not like his books are a scarce commodity. He's probably the most reprinted guy other than Arthur Conan Doyle out there. When you go to a used bookstore, I go to a used bookstore, they're absolutely choking on Earl Stanley Gardner reprints. And so there's nothing special about this constant stream of releases of his books by Hard Case Crime other than the nice cover art. They must be selling uh, because, or you know, they wouldn't be clogging up their release calendar with them. So I'm glad that Hard Case Crime exists. But I think their batting average for releases has been terrible for a long, long time. I see them really as a cover art company putting awesome paintings on what's lately become a pretty weak book selection. And there's lots of other companies like Starkhouse who do what they do way better. Starkhouse has been cleaning hard case crimes clock for the better part of a decade by putting out better books. Again, they don't necessarily always have the covers, right. but uh, but that's the thing. So that's my opinion. Any closing thoughts before we do our reviews? I'm just getting my feet wet with hard case crime. I've read a handful, and thankfully I can rely on your experience with these books, and you always lead me to the very best selections. You turn me on to The Vengeful Virgin by Gil Brewer, uh, the aforementioned Grifter's Game by Lawrence Block, and, of course, the first Corey by uh, Max Allen Collins. So thanks for teaching a young Jedi some tricks. Yeah, and we, we, and <laughs> people are going to be angry at us because they think I'm saying bad things about hard case crime. I think hard case crime is great. I think you know, doesn't I can I can pick out twelve to twenty of my favorite novels ever that they reprinted, and their covers are great. But when you talk to somebody about hard case crime, all they want to talk about are the covers, and so that says something. Right, right. All right. So why don't you go ahead and do your review? Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, the Colorado Kid was published a year after Hard Case Crime was established. The book was released in September 2004 with a throwback artwork uh, with throwback artwork by painter Glenn Orbick. It's a huge acquisition for the publisher. Uh, Tom, is this book the highest selling for Hard Case Crime? Do it certainly you... was at the time. Okay. I, I, you know, I, it's not a publicly traded company, right? So I don't get to see how it did. It's, but it's it's that or Joyland are the is their yeah. best. Okay. Clearly, their best seller. All right. Uh, so despite the title, uh, the Colorado Kid is actually set in Maine. This is where a majority of Stephen King's novels and short stories take place, although lately he's been adding more and more Florida locations to his book simply because he lives there half the year. But for this book, the location's a small coastal community called Moose Look. The book's narrative is really simple. Uh, there's three employees of the town's newspaper, and they sit in a diner, and they just talk among themselves about a mystery that's plagued the town. 25 years ago, two teenagers discover a male corpse propped up against a tree along the coastline. The dead body is deemed the Colorado Kid after some clues are found leading to his original origin. How the body got to Maine is the main mystery. In the beginning, there's no identity, there's no agenda, there's no murder, just the body and the theory that he died while eating something. Normally, this would be a really boring book. I mean, who wants to you know sit around and read a conversation between three people about a 25-year-old mystery? But King makes it work through the conversational-style narrative. The characters are funny and they're charming, Two of them are just old men, and they have these small-town mannerisms. The other is a young female college grad that's been working at the paper for something like four months, so she's fairly new. So the reader is sort of warmly placed into the narrative as a tourist. We're hearing about the town's history and the mystery. King name-drops authors like Agatha Christie. He talks about Rex Stout, and he even de dedicates the book to his admiration of Dan J. Marlowe. But the story itself fits in technically as a crime fiction novel, or better yet, is a locked room puzzle. How did the body get there? You know, that that kind of thing. I think because of that, it fits nicely into Hard Case Crimes Library. The book inspired a television show that ran on sci-fi called Haven. I've watched the first two seasons of that show, and I don't see any similarities between the book and the show. Hmm. It's it's like saying the ocean inspired the building of the Titanic. It's, it's loose, and I think it was probably just a smart marketing ploy by uh, sci-fi. The show sucks. The book is good, but it doesn't really have an ending. I think that the author just didn't have one to write. For that, it's you know it's a really lousy ending, but it's a good book nonetheless. And again, this is Colorado Kid uh, by Stephen King. I also read Colorado Kid, and I think I enjoyed it more than you did, but I was also let down by the ending. It was like he couldn't think of a way to end the novel, so he decided just to not end it at all. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I want to review another hard case crime uh, release by a well-known horror author named John Ferris. Now, the book is called Baby Mall, M-O-L-L, -L, and it was originally written under the pseudonym of Steve Brackeen and published in 1958. When hard case crime reprinted the book in 2011, they released under John Ferris's own name. 
was about a fishing supply owner store and owner named Pete Mallory. He's our narrator. And he's engaged to marry a rich heiress named Elaine. Now, Pete has a secret past he hasn't told Elaine about that might throw a monkey wrench in their wedding plans because Pete used to run with a gangster named Macy who controls the rackets in South Florida. And someone has been bumping off members of Macy's old crew one by one with maximum brutality and suffering. Macy needs Pete to come out of retirement, identify the killer, and neutralize him before the gangster boss gets a knife in the belly. The request is spiced with a dash of blackmail, so Pete's not really in a position to decline. As such, it's off to Florida for our narrator. Of course, agreeing to this assignment from his former boss puts Pete squarely in the crosshairs, and this leads to some vivid, violent, and visceral action sequences throughout the paperback. The core of the novel is Pete's investigation into who is killing Macy's inner circle. Is it a rival gangster? Could it be a grudge from the past? Or what's going on? Now, Pete becomes acquainted with the women in the mobster's sphere of influence, and crime bosses and their lieutenants are always having chronic girl problems. I think that probably one of these women was the baby mall from the title, but the paperback was clearly titled by a Fawcett gold medal executive looking to monetize 1958's America's fascination with bad girls. There's no character in it that could logically be the baby mall in question. So the actual contents of the book don't jibe with the cover art of of either iteration of the cover. Uh, so consider yourself warned if you were looking for a story about a godfather's woman. But I thought Baby Mall was a great book. It was very fast and compelling. It was well told. Great maturity. The author at the time, John Ferris, was 22 years old when he wrote that book. Hmm. Uh, there may have been too many characters, but um, you can just make a list on your bookmark. So thanks to Hard Case Crime, uh, they should have, you, uh, in, you should have no trouble scoring a copy of this with new and alluring cover art. Uh, but the story inside is what really counts, much more so than cover art. And for this one, the story inside is a real winner. And uh, that's all I got for this week, Eric. Why don't you wrap us up? Yeah, this concludes another episode of the Paperback Warrior podcast. Please join us at paperbackwarrior.com for bait daily book reviews. And we'll see you here next Monday for another exciting podcast episode. On behalf of my po- broadcast partner, Tom, this is Eric saying so long. Bye-bye, guys.